And about 5 minutes, she will be uh, connected. Oh, she's already connected. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK? So she uh, will talk for about an hour. I don't know to which extent uh, we will have time for questions and answers, but we will we'll try our best. Depends on her agenda. Except this whistling. You're going to use the big one. Yes. One, two, 
say it. It was like it was a plus twenty four D B. Someone put in the calendar on. She's in New York. She's in the NIH in Washington. Oh, she's in Washington. Yeah. It's eight hours difference. From where? From off? Yeah. I think it's six. Though. Six. I think it's six. On the East Coast, it's six, probably. So it's like 11 in the morning. It's like this. Yeah. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Where do I sit? Hello, Nora. Hi, Nora. How are you? Where are you all? I don't see you. You don't see anybody? No, I don't. Do you see me? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. we do. Ah, I cannot see you. Entonces, ¿les puedo hablar en español? Sí, también puede, también puede, pero creo que no. Creo que no, estoy hablando en español. Ok. Sí. Oye, es, 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 es Rafael, ¿no? Sí, es Rafael, ¿qué tal? Te, te conecté. Sí, es mi dog. ¿Cuántos están allá en este, Barcelona? ¿Eh? ¿Cuántos son ustedes ahorita? Pues somos, aquí en la sala estaremos unos 35, 40, 40 más o menos. Ok, sí, me quería nada más por curiosidad saber cuántos están ahí. 40 aproximadamente. Uh, so, I'm, cambia en inglés, I'm shifting okay. to uh, apologize, but I could not resist the temptation to speak in Spanish, which I come to realize is highly rewarding to my brain, <laughs> speaking in Spanish. But for all of you that don't speak Spanish, I'm, I'm going to actually go over my presentation in English. and. As I had, uh, they told me, Nora, speak about drug addiction. And I said, oh my God, speak about drug addiction. That's a very extensive topic. So 
I asked uh, Anto Bonchi, I said, Anto, what should I speak about? And he says, Nora, speak about your own studies, which is therefore what I'm going to be doing. Uh, um, our studies, as you know or may not know, have been based on the use of imaging technologies to explore the changes in the brain of people that are addicted that may help us explain their loss of control with respect to taking drugs and their inability to actually uh, control those urges even when they want to no longer take them. So this is distinct from uh, what I presume you have been hearing in animal experiments where you have a much better control of a lot of variables because you are actually exposing them to specific contexts, specific drugs at specific times. In humans, that is not the case. But on the other hand, it's ultimately the disease of addiction in humans that we want to understand and treat. And therefore, by studying directly human beings that are suffering from the pathology, you can extract information that can then guide preclinical studies to help you better understand the molecular mechanisms that are playing havoc in the brain of people that are addicted to drugs. So we've uh, started our studies with brain imaging, very much focusing on the brain dopamine system. And the reason we have done this is it is clearly an extremely important neurotransmitter. And in fact, we now know from animal experiments initially and now in humans, that the ability of drugs of abuse to increase dopamine in reward regions, and most of the work has really concentrated on the nucleus accumbens, is associated with not just the rewarding effects, but actually the motivation to consume with, uh, when, when exposed to the drug or to cues that, that are associated with the drug. And this is a mechanism actually just hijacked from normal processes by which nature has evolved in order to, serve, to ensure that we do behaviors that are crucial for survival of the individual and the species. And, uh, and that's why our brain responds to reward. That's why we do we like to do things that are pleasurable, because this is an evolutionary design method that actually you see in very primitive organisms that um, is very effective. You do behaviors that are pleasurable, and you avoid behaviors that are um, uncomfortable and produce discomfort. And these systems are modulated uh, by dopamine. It's one of the neurotransmitters that really regulates these uh, associations between a pleasurable response and the behaviors that subsequently follow and the avoiding of an adversive response. And this is the data initially where it came around, a lot of the work from microdialysis experiments that show that all of the drugs, amphetamine, nicotine, alcohol, even the uh, THC, 9-THC, increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. But it also shows that food, not surprisingly, these things were developed not for us to take drugs, but for uh, ensuring that natural rewards are, are going to be driving behavior. Food increases dopamine, and actually, in the animal experiments, it was noted that the ability of a food to increase dopamine was very much related to the state of satiety of the uh, animal. So if the animal was full and you expose them to food, then dopamine will not go up in their brain, in their nucleus accumbens, which in turn uh, led them to not pursue the behaviors necessary to consume. And so this was identified as a signaling mechanism that provides a motivation to consume the, the food. And, and in the case of food in general, there is, uh, when you eat the food, then the dopamine cells stop firing when you get exposed to it again because you are satiety, satiety, rich satiety, and therefore you don't consume any more food. But with drugs, the story is different because you keep on increasing dopamine in the nucleus accumbens even when you con consume the drug repeatedly, and that therefore leads to one to want to have more. There's not a natural satiety process as may happen with food or we now know also happens with sex. The other difference between food and drugs or sex and drugs is that the magnitude of the increases in dopamine are, are larger and longer lasting with these drugs 
than they are with the natural rewards. And it is believed that the supraphysiological increases in dopamine, this longer duration of the effects of uh, dopamine when given by drugs, as well as the lack of satiety process that normally would modulate these responses, that lack of uh, this mechanism in the case of drugs then triggers the neuroplasticity changes that can result in compulsive drug administration. Interestingly, we now know that certain foods and, uh, and certain individuals, sex, can trigger similar adaptations. And in fact, in the case of food, certain foods with very high content, the reward content, that produce that immediate uh, increases in dopamine can overcome those satiety process and also lead to compulsive food administration. And we also know that there are certain individuals and certain conditions actually where you may even be able to create these in animal models for compulsive sexual behavior. Now the neuroplastic changes that then facilitate this transition into compulsive behaviors while triggered by dopamine are, um, are, are, are leading to changes in downstream neurotransmitter systems. Both the GABA and the glutamate systems have been implicated and both of these neurotransmitter systems suffer significant changes in the strength of their signaling. More, most work has actually focused on excitatory neurotransmission to glutamate synapses. And the elegant work among others by Malenka, by Ponchi, by uh, Calaivas has shown that these among the neuroplastic changes that are occurring that strengthen the signaling through the excitatory synapses is the shifting between the AMPA and, uh, and the NMDA receptor corrents. And this strengthened signaling but also makes it inflexible to new adaptations with repeated exposure. And these neuroplastic changes in the excitatory system have been noted in several areas of the limbic brain, as well as the prefrontal cortex. And of course, this is an incredibly interesting area of research because it's actually um, driving us to try to understand how do these synaptic changes occur? How do the receptor change their subunit composition? And how do they recover? So this is, uh, hopefully, I, I predict that you will be hearing a lot about this. And I'm not going to be speaking about this particular area because this is not something that we currently can directly image at the molecular level in human individuals. But we have a focus then on that aspect of the dopamine system because it's the one that's going to be triggering these neuroplastic changes. And this is a human studies where we actually uh, were trying to understand what are the mechanisms by which drugs of abuse can produce reward in human subjects. Because while increases in dopamine have been shown to be important for uh, rats and monkeys, it was crucial, of course, to determine if this is happening in humans. And this is a strategy that we have been using in our laboratory and many others have used all over the world. It uses positron emission tomography and the way that you measure changes in dopamine produced by drugs or also behaviors, you can do these two with behaviors, is by using a ligand that is um, label the compound that's labeled by a positron emitter, carbon-11, which is a radioactive isotope. And these compounds, the one that we use is raclopride labeled with carbon-11, bind to dopamine D2 receptors. But their affin affinity for this receptor is relatively low, such that they can only bind when those receptors are available. That is, they are not binding dopamine. So to the left, you see an image that was obtained when subjects were given a placebo and then injected with C-Lab and Raclopride. Under those conditions, baseline conditions, placebo conditions, um, approximately 85 to 90% of the dopamine D2 receptors are free and available for Raclopride to bind them. So you see the high activity concentrated in the central areas, which corresponds to the striate on that plane is more or less at the dorsal level, dorsal caudate, you see it, and dorsal putana. Then you give a drug, and we have given intravenous methylphenidate, and intravenous methylphenidate binds to the dopamine transporters, and by binding to the dopamine transporters, it blocks the recycling and removal of dopamine from the synapse back into the terminal, which is the main mechanism by which dopamine signals are terminated in our brains, particularly in the striatum. 
When you do that, and this is actually exactly what cocaine does, and, and the mechanism by which cocaine is rewarded, blocking the dopamine transporter, and methylphenidate does exactly the same thing. So not surprisingly, intravenous methylphenidate can produce a very intense high. Intravenous methylphenidate is not distinguished, by the way, from cocaine by cocaine addiction. So in this case, we gave intravenous methylphenidate, it blocks dopamine transporters, dopamine accumulates in the synapse, it binds to the receptors, so the receptors are occupied in such a way that when you eat raclopride again, raclopride cannot bind to them and its uh, binding goes down in the sperm. And you can see that by comparing the images to your left to those in the right, that decrease in the, the radioactivity, which is seen here as a, a decrease in the signal that comes from the red, which is the highest intensity uh, in our scale. You can use these images and you transform them into quantitative measures after appropriate mathematical modeling. And then you can get an estimate of relative changes in dopamine. And when you do that, you can then use that measure to see if it is in any way correlated with a subjective perception of reward that subjects who were injected with an intravenous methylphenidate reported. And we showed many, many years ago um, in the upper part, this is a, a paper we published in 1999, that indeed it was, that individuals in whom intravenous methylphenidate uh, produced the largest changes in dopamine, which is in the x-axis, had the most intense subjective perception of high, which is in the y-axis. And that's a, a very strong regressor. It actually accounts for close to 50% of the variability in the differences in the, re in the subjective rewarding effects of intravenous methylphenidate indicating that in human subjects, the ability of intravenous methylphenidate to increase dopamine was actually uh, associated with the subjective perception of reward. However, when you, instead of giving methylphenidate intravenously, give it orally, which is of course the way that we used to treat it uh, for children with ADHD, a very different picture emerges. Oral methylphenidate is able to also inhibit the binding of raclopride because it's also increasing dopamine or it's not producing a high. And you see that. You see that it increases dopamine as evidenced by the changes in dopamine in the x-axis, but there's really no subjective perception of high. Indicating that yes, increases in dopamine are important, but they are not sufficient. So if you do it, do some, those two conditions, intravenous versus oral, what is it that emerges as a very important variable? Well, uh, when you inject intravenous methylphenidate, uh, we injected it and one minute later, we were measuring these changes. When we gave oral methylphenidate, we have to wait 60 minutes in order to see these changes in dopamine. And there lies the difference. When you inject intravenous methylphenidate, you're producing very fast changes in dopamine. Whereas when you are giving it orally, it increases dopamine slowly. And in the upper um, diagram here, you see the pharmacokinetics, that is the temporal uh, course of um, the distribution of methylphenidate in the non-human primate brain when it's injected intravenously in green versus when we give the radioactive methylphenidate orally in purple. When you inject it intravenously, you are peaking the concentration in brain around uh, six, eight minutes. When you're giving it orally, it takes approximately one to two hours to pick. And this then, of course, translates in the one case in very, very fast dopamine increases, whereas in the oral, these increases are very slow. Now, why is this relevant vis-a-vis -vis the rewarding effects? And it's relevant uh, if we actually go into the anatomy and physiology of the dopamine system, because we now know that the dopamine cells, actually we've known for many years, have two modes of firing. Dopamine, very slow firing, tonic dopamine firing, 2 to 10 hertz, which actually results in relatively low, moderate levels of dopamine, whose function is really to prepare the system to react to stimuli in the environment. On the other hand, there is the, the basic dopamine cell signaling that results in very short lasting but very fast dopamine uh, pulses, 15 to 30 uh, hertz that resort also in very fast and high increases in dopamine that are short lasting. Now, so these two modes of firing of dopamine cells uh, have been investigated extensively. 
Now, if we translate these into try to understand why they would be relevant for reward, why we come to realize that um, there is actually the way when you are producing dopamine phasic, uh, phasic firing, you are raising dopamine sufficiently to activate not just dopamine T2 receptors, which are receptors that have high affinity for dopamine, but also to activate dopamine D1 receptors, which have low affinity for dopamine. So in order to stimulate D1 receptors, you need to produce very fast and high increases in dopamine. Whereas the T2 receptors are activated both by tonic and basic dopamine, the basic dopamine will predominantly activate, the D1 receptors will be predominantly activated by basic dopamine cell firing. Now, D2 and D1 receptors signal through different pathways, uh, D1 through the direct pathway, D2 through the indirect pathway. And we now know also from extensive studies that these two subsystems counteract and balance each other. And we also know from extensive studies in preclinical mice genetically uh, modified to express D1 or, or not express it or to have or not have D2 receptors or to have more or less efficient system for signaling on D1 or D2, that the D1 receptor system is crucial for the rewarding effects of drugs, such that if you create a D1 receptor knockout mice, these animals will be much less sensitive to the rewarding effects of drugs. So they are crucial for reward. On the other hand, you can eliminate D2 receptors and frogs can continue to be rewarding. And from studies, it appears that it is the balance between the D1 and the D2 receptor systems that ultimately is responsible for the rewarding effects. And that when you inject the drug, producing very fast increases in dopamine, you're going to get temporarily a predominance of the D1 over the D2 receptor signaling. And we've actually investigated this in the animals. You, you, using transgenic mice that express GFP uh, in either in the D1 receptor cells or in two D2 receptor cells in the stream. And we have measured how these D1 receptor cells respond to the administration of cocaine and how the T2 receptors do it. And measure it dynamically. So that's what you see with optical imaging to the right that, and of course, you have to do this in separate groups of animals because the transgene only expresses GFP in D1 on, or G, GFP in D2 receptor cells. When you look at the D1 neurons in strieno, which is the blue line, and, what you, and you're measuring calcium when you give cocaine, you see an immediate, very fast increase in the uh, calcium content of the cell that peaks around 10 minutes, and then it slowly plateaus. When you, give, when you are measuring, how, however, calcium content in D2 receptor cells, you see that calcium decreases, which is consistent with the fact that dopamine is inhibitory to D2 receptor uh, containing cells, as opposed to being stimulatory in D1 receptor containing striatal cells. And the other thing that's interesting with respect to the decreases in the D2 receptor signaling process is that the decreases in calcium are slower than the fast increases that you observe in calcium in the D1. So there's a faster response in D1, but there's a slower but more consistent response that continues to go down throughout the 30 minutes of our measurements. Again, um, identifying why this uh, dynamic that is the pharmacokinetic properties of fast uh, effects for increasing dopamine are crucial for drug reward. So it's not just that drugs increase dopamine, but that they increase it in such a way that they are emulating basic dopamine signaling in the brain and thus stimulating the D1 receptor direct pathway in our brains. Now, this is with respect to reward. I mean, and we all, if we were given cocaine, I predict, depending on the doses, we would all probably feel some level of reward. But we, we would experience it as, as interesting, and, and that's that. I mean, it wouldn't interfere with our behavior. However, if we were to be addicted and someone had uh, 
gave us cocaine, and in a tiny amount, we will immediately fall into a compulsive pattern of intake. If the drug was available under those conditions, you can guarantee that the person will compulsively administer it, like it would occur also with an animal that has become addicted to the drug. A very small dose of cocaine can trigger this behavior. So what is the difference? How is it that in one case, an animal that's not exposed or a human that's not addicted receives the drug, feels reward, and then that's the end of it, no big deal. Whereas someone loses control and does crazy things in order to continue taking it. Well, one of the hypotheses has been for many, many years that the reason is that there is a sensitized response of the dopamine reward system in people that are addicted. And this theory emerged in part because of all of the work that has uh, resulted from the sensitization responses that have been reported, uh, for sti particularly for stimulant drugs, but not just for them. And so an hypothesis in the clinical literature has been that people become addicted are addicted because in them, the drugs are more rewarding. They activate much more those dopamine system that then drive the compulsion to want more and more and more. <coughs> Ergo, if you're more sensitive to the reward, therefore you will want it more and more and more. And we, many years ago, also after it was 1997, went on to try to determine if this was the case, our first study. To ask the question, is indeed, are indeed people addicted to the drug having larger increases in dopamine when they take a uh, drug like cocaine? And, um, and is this the, the cause that one of the molecular mechanisms underlying uh, addiction in humans? So we published this study in 1997, which actually completely uh, showed the opposite from this hypothesis. Uh, and what you see in the upper left slide, that the images of raclopride on a normal control with placebo, and after that person has been given intravenous methylphenidate, and you see that decreases in the raclopride binding because dopamine went up, occupied receptors, if raclopride can no longer bind. But look at the cocaine abuser below that, and you can basically, visually, you see no differences. And so this is an image. You can then quantify the relative changes in the specific binding of raclopride to its receptors. And then you can then plot these for the controls versus the abu abusers, which is uh, the, first the, uh, the first histogram to the, to the right that shows changes in Vmax over KD. And you can see that, indeed, in cocaine abusers, contrary to what we had hypothesized, the magnitudes of the changes in dopamine produced by intravenous methylphenidate, which, by the way, I told you, cocaine abusers don't distinguish from intravenous cocaine, was dramatically reduced. It was less than 50% what we were observing in controls. And also, the cell reports of high were actually significantly attenuated. Now, these were individuals that had been detoxified and kept in the in the inpatient unit to ensure that they were not taking cocaine. So they had been detoxified at least for six weeks. So a question that emerged was whether this decline in dopamine signaling was just a function of the withdrawal and, uh, and, and in withdrawal and really didn't reflect uh, what happens when people are actively pursuing the consumption of the drug. So we recently replicated those studies um, in people that were actively taking cocaine. And we studied them, um, again, just the same protocol. This is a recent study. So what you're seeing here are images not of one subject, but we have averaged the images for all of the controls, which for this particular study were 17 healthy controls, matched to 17 cocaine abusers. And the data for the controls is in the lower row on the left uh, on the left side of the slide, and you can see clearly how uh, raclopride binding went down when you gave a methylphenidate. But if you look on the upper panel uh, for the average images, this is not one selected subject; it's all of them average. Placebo, and then you see intravenous methylphenidate, and again, it's hard to see any difference between those two average images. So when you quantify this, which is the histograms to the right, you can see in the ventral striatum. Now we're looking at the ventral striatum, which is where the nucleus accumbens is located. So it's a very relevant area for the reward circuitry. And um, you see 
that there is actually a very large difference between them. And what was striking was in cocaine abusers, you only see a change in 3%, which is really not something we can differentiate from placebo. So, so in the cocaine abusers, we could not, in this group of cocaine abusers, differentiate the effects of intravenous methylphenidate from those of placebo, vis-a-vis the ability of the drug to increase dopamine. And like in the other study, we also saw that in these individuals, the self-reports of high were decreased. And, and yet despite these decreases in the response uh, vis-a-vis dopamine in the ventral or despite their lower high, they still wanted the drug. So in this study then, the question that someone brought up uh, is, so you're seeing it in active cocaine abusers. These are people that have not been detoxified. But how do you know that the lack of response in these cocaine abusers of yours is not due to the fact that you have them in a laboratory condition which is very sterile? And that is very, very different from the way people take drugs. They are actually um, surrounded by cocaine cues or alcohol cues if they are alcoholics. And, and those, that interaction of the drug with those cues may be crucial in terms of their ability to perceive uh, to produce these dopamine increases. So we subsequently did a story to actually try to address this question, which we uh, recently published in Molecular Psychiatry. It all it came out, like I think, last month or this month, something like that, in which we also took active cocaine abusers. But in this case, we gave them intravenous methylphenidate under two conditions. On a condition they gave intravenous methylphenidate with was preceded and continued at, with simultaneous administration of cocaine cues, which were administered to them through a video that presented scenes of individuals um, preparing and administering cocaine in ways that the subjects actually like to administer it themselves. And then on another day, which was um, randomly um, ordered differently, just by random to make sure that there was not an effect of, of time of presentation on a different day, we gave them intravenous methylphenidate, but instead of having them watch videos of people administering cocaine, we have them watching videos of nature scenes. And, and the images here are being presented compared with control subjects, and they are uh, presented using statistical parametric mapping results, which projects that significant levels in an MRI scan to identify the areas where there is a significant difference in racoprite binding, specific binding, which is a function of changes in dopamine. So in the normal controls, you see in the upper row that at, at different planes of the, where you can see the striatum from the dorsal part to the right to the ventral parts on the left, that there are significant changes in racoprite because dopamine has gone up in all of those areas of the brain. Now this is, I'm presenting that data for the significance levels of 0.001. If I put that significant levels for the cocaine abusers, I see absolutely nothing. So I have to decrease the threshold to 0.05, which is an uncorrected, which is a very, very low threshold of significance. And when I, and I have to do that, so otherwise I don't see anything. So when I, so you can see that the thresholding is very different. And even with this very low threshold, you can see the significant differences between the control and the cocaine abusers, whether they were exposed to use or not. And in the cocaine abusers, you can see a little bit of signals in the ventral striatum, which is the left slides, the ones for both conditions. And the little signals voxels there in the putamen, but very, very minimal. And again, with very low threshold. And these did not differ for whether you expose them to use or not. That was not significantly different. What was very significantly different was the magnitude of uh, changes between controls and cocaine abusers. So indicating that this attenuation that we are observing is not due to the fact that they don't have cues, not at all. It is due evidently to what we and now the, I mean, the group at Columbia has had very similar finding to ours. We have extended these to alcoholics. They have also shown that in alcoholics, we have extended these to methamphetamine addicts. 
and the group at Columbia with cocaine abusers and us with methamphetamine abusers have also shown that these decreases in the response to the stimulant drug is very blunt of dopaminergic reactivity or dopamine release actually is associated with worse outcomes. The lower the signals, um, the greater the likelihood that you will relapse when these individuals are follow up uh, with substance abuse treatment, indicating that are actually significant in terms of the addiction as uh, the addiction phenotype as a disease. So we've taken this data to then try to understand, well, if there is decreased D2 receptor signaling during cocaine intoxication, how would that drive the behavior of wanting to want more? Because that's exactly what happens when individuals that are addicted to cocaine, even these ones with very, very weak dopamine signals, you see that the dopamine, they still have very intense craving. They have low high, but very intense craving. Why is this happening? And I, I cannot answer these questions in humans because the problem is we do not have very good uh, ligands to assess similar phenomena on the D1 receptor system. But we can do this in animals because as I told you, I mean, there are uh, genetic mice that express EGFP on D1 versus genetic mice that express the, uh, the GFP in D2 receptors. And I show you the data of what happens with uh, cocaine on the naive animals, the first time they get cocaine, how D1 goes, signaling calcium goes up very rapidly, and uh, the calcium decreases in D2 receptor signaling very slowly. So now we've done exactly the same studies, but we've uh, compared the acute, the naive animals when given the cocaine for the first time, versus chronic animals that have been given cocaine for two weeks, and then challenged with cocaine. So, both of these animals were studying the effects of acute cocaine, except that in one, the one called acute, these naive animals, and the ones chronic, they have experienced cocaine repeatedly. And we do this differently on the, in mice that have EGFP on D1 receptors versus G, EGFP on D2 receptors to differentiate uh, the differences uh, in chronic in these two systems. We've seen it in, in humans, very weak in responses for D2, but we don't uh, have any data on D1 receptors. And so here we have, and D1 receptors go up in the acute, you see, uh, calcium goes up, and in the chronic, this is attenuated. But you still, nonetheless, you see that significant increases in the chronic. It's less than in the acute, but you still see them. On the other hand, when you look at the D2 receptors, in the acute, you see these slow decreases in calcium. And in the chronic, it's basically almost a flat line. It's almost like you completely block them. And, and, and so that when you look at it and say, well, the signaling is a balance between D1 and D2 receptors, how does these relative neuroplastic changes in the D1 versus the D2 actually uh, reflect the signaling during the state of intoxication? When you are naive versus when you are chronic, which is the utmost diagram to the right. So in the naive, you create a ratio after waiting for the number of cells, and this was done in the sphero, D1 versus D2. And when you, during intoxication, you see that during the first uh, eight minutes, there is a very strong predominance of D1 receptor signaling over D2 receptors. But this returns to baseline actually to an equivalent balance. It's balanced approximately around 20, 20 minutes, such that the signaling by these two uh, systems uh, is actually equal. When you go to the chronic animal, you see a very different uh, signaling process. The D1 overpowers the D2 receptors throughout the whole 30 minute period of the scan, indicating that the normal mechanism that opposes the D1 receptor signaling, which is the D2 receptors, has been almost in this particular uh, experiment appears to be overcome by the fact that the reduction of signaling in the D2 receptors is much greater than the reduction of D1 receptor signaling that you see in the chronic mice. And as a result, you have the predominance of D1 receptors, which are the ones that actually move uh, the rewarding and the drive to consume the drugs. The D2 receptors, 
oppose it. And we now know that any intervention in mice or rats that increases signaling to D2 receptors, increasing signaling to D2 receptors, which is exactly the opposite of what's going on in addicted people, so increasing signaling interferes with the rewarding effects of cocaine. Whereas weakening signaling through D2 receptors favors compulsive administration of cocaine. And this is actually exactly opposite of what happens with a D1 receptor. Any intervention that strengthens D1 receptor enhances cocaine reward. And interventions that weaken D1 receptor signaling decrease reward. And therefore, one can start to postulate that the decreases in D2 receptor signaling in the striatum that we are observing in addicted people are likely to control a trigger to compulsive behaviors because they cannot actually overpower the D1 receptor system. So this is at the striatal level. Now, what uh, happens beyond the striatal level? Because obviously, the, the dopamine D1 and D2 receptor systems are modulating striatotalamic cortical system that then are responsible for the behaviors that we exert. So what happens? How is the how are these changes in D2 receptor signaling being translated in the function of different areas of the brain? So we've done extensive studies in a wide variety of individuals that are addicted to drugs. And actually, interestingly, we've also started in parallel to do similar studies in morbidly obese individuals. And in these uh, in addicted people, which is what I'm speaking today about, we have shown that um, by measuring D2 receptors, we've studied them at baseline, but we also studied them, as I showed you, with stimulation challenges. But we've done extensive studies just at baseline to see if you don't give drugs, if you don't give cues, just at baseline. How are those D2 receptors signaling in the brain? And how does that then influence the rest of the function of the human brain, which we assess by measuring brain glucose metabolism? So in the same subjects, we measure D2 receptors and then measure metabolic activity with glucose, which is uh, a very sensitive indicator of brain function, such that when an area of the brain is less active, glucose metabolism goes down, when an area of the brain is very active, glucose metabolism goes up. And we've shown, shown like many other investigators, uh, using imaging technologies or post-mortem brain, or also studies in rodents or studies in non-human primates, that individuals exposed to drugs or animals exposed to drugs appear to have a, a, a down-regulation of dopamine D2 receptors in their stream. So it's not just that they are releasing less dopamine, they also have lower levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And, the, and this we've uh, corroborated with uh, different types of radio tracers, and this has also been corroborated with postmortem human brain. And, and this is just two of our studies in cocaine abusers measuring dopamine D2 receptor availability at baseline. In the left, uh, using endothel spiroperidol, which is a ligand with very high affinity for dopamine D2 receptors such that it's not sensitive to endogenous competition with dopamine in patients uh, that were detoxified for six weeks uh, in an inpatient facility. And to the right, you see the data for an independent cohort of cocaine abusers studied with, a, with C11 raclobride, uh, also detoxified at least for six weeks, but in an outpatient basis. And they are compared com compare against age, uh, age match subjects. All of these are males. No, normal controls in pink, cocaine abusers in green, expressed as a function of age because as we grow older, dopamine D2 receptors go down. And you can clearly see that uh, irrespective of um, whether the radio ligand, there is a significant reduction as a whole in cocaine abusers when accounting for age. Cocaine abusers have lower availability levels of dopamine D2 receptors. We now know that it is levels of dopamine D2 receptors that are also reduced because they also have decreases in dopamine release. So they have lower levels and lower, lower release. And, but it's not uh, polarized, it's not categorical. As there are some cocaine abusers that have normal levels of receptors and they have some normal controls that seem to have low levels equivalent to those of cocaine abusers. 
which actually highlights to the variability in, that we see in across populations of human subjects as, as it relates to the levels of expression of dopamine D2 receptors. But it also tells us that while D2 receptors, because it's a very consistent finding, it's actually something that we have seen um, in animal experiments and others have seen in animal experiments exposed to drugs. It's actually something that is, must be significant and maybe driving the compulsive intake. It's not sufficient because if it were sufficient, it would mean that you having low levels would mean that you are addicted and some controls like the one on the right, uh, there's one that's 30 years old with very low levels, it would be addicted and it's not. Or why is it, how do you explain that, that individuals, there's a, a, a cocaine abuser that's 30 year old with high levels is still addicted. It indicates in my brain certainly that it, what D2 receptors may be doing is modulating, modulating vulnerability. And in fact, in animal experiment, we've shown this to be the case, and this is illustrated with an experiment that we replicated this, but this is the first experiment in 2001 that we published in uh, sprang dolly rats that were made addicted to alcohol, and when they were compulsively administering the alcohol, we injected them stereotactically with an adenovirus inside of which was the D2 receptor gene into the nucleus accumbens. This resulted in a significant increase in D2 receptors on day four, approximately 50%. The increases are short lasting, and by then 10, it's going back to baseline. Or we injected them again on day 20, and the receptors go back up in at day 24, we see them again increase. And in parallel, we measure their, their alcohol intake, and you see percent change in alcohol intake uh, decreases. And you see significant, significant reductions in alcohol intake as long as the receptors are elevated. As the receptors go back to baseline, alcohol turn to bring interest to return to baseline. You inject again at day 24, and again, you see a dramatic reduction in alcohol intake. And then blue is just the sham injected animals. They were injected with the adenovirus, but we know the receptor gene, and it has no effect. So you need it is the increases in D2 receptors that are driving these uh, very significant reductions in the amount of alcohol taken. So it is really the amount of alcohol taken. So when you increase D2 receptors, you really are inhibiting the consumption of high quantities of alcohol. Or we have shown exactly the same thing. If you increase D2 receptors, we inhibit the consumption of high quantities of cocaine. And this is exactly what, what prevention is about. It's the consumption of high quantities the compulsive consumption of these drugs. And so when we go back to humans and say, well, how is this being driven? Why is it having low levels of D2 receptors making you vulnerable in striatal to actually compulsively take these drugs? And so when we look at and ask the question to the data, uh, where in the brain are we seeing uh, that the reductions in D2 receptors in the striatal where air, which areas of the brain do we see when that is happening an associated decrease in function? And when you do these studies, and we've done it uh, systematically, cocaine abusers, methamphetamine abusers, and alcoholics, and, and as I said, we've also done it in obese individuals, and the findings, interestingly, all of them are the same. We show that when the receptors are low, these D2 receptors are low in the striatum, that is consistently associated with decreased metabolic activity in the orbital frontal cortex, in the anterior cingulate gyros, and in the dorsolateral frontal cortex. And I'm showing you data there uh, in the images for brain glucose metabolism that compares metabolism in a normal control and in a cocaine abuser so that you can see that decreased metabolic activity in the orbital frontal cortex, that decreased metabolic activity in the anterior cingulate gyros. This is not just specific for cocaine, that's a cocaine abuser, but we've seen it for a, a wide variety of drug addictions. And then to the right, you see the images for Rakloprite showing the decreases in the, the average images for methamphetamine abusers and alcoholics and cocaine abusers that decreases in D2 receptor. And in the middle, you see the scatter plots, the regression, regression plots um, that uh, contrast D2 receptors versus metabolic activity. I'm showing it there for the orbital frontal cortex. 
showing that the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the metabolic activity in these brain regions, orbital frontal cortex, and anterior cingulate cortex. I'm showing in tender. And to a lesser extent, dorsolateral frontal cortex. Now, these are baseline. So these are individuals that are baseline, which indicates that if you have lower levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the striatum, lower signaling, because these D2 receptors have high affinity, so they have some level of tonic activity when you're not stimulated, making you receptive and regulating the activity of cortical regions. What it's showing is that low levels of D2 receptors in the sphere is associated with decreased activity of prefrontal areas in our brain. And so happens that these prefrontal areas of the brain are crucial in processes involved with self-regulation -regul and control. In, ha in fact, actually, and, 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 and let me, before I go into that, to show you another even more compelling uh, study because I'm showing exactly the same findings in which we look also at D2 receptors and brain glucose metabolism to see which areas of the brain these two measures were correlated. But what's very compelling about this particular study that I'm showing you here is that these were not people that were addicted to drugs. These were individuals who had a family history of alcoholism. <coughs> whose father, a biological father, was an alcoholic and who had at least another uh, second degree relative that was an alcoholic. And in these individuals, we then, what you're showing here, I'm showing the data and statistical parametric mapping that um, identifies throughout the whole brain, not, not just basically selecting certain areas of the brain, throughout the whole brain, where do levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the striatum correlate with brain glucose metabolism. And you can see exactly what we have shown in addicted people. In the lower planes, you are seeing the orbital frontal cortex, both medial and lateral. In the higher planes, like the minus four, my, C minus eight millimeters, <coughs> and upward, you're seeing the dorsal single edge arrows. And if you look there also, you can see the dorsal prefrontal cortex. And interestingly, we know that in these uh, studies, when we did parametric to mapping that also the anterior insula is uh, linked, decreases in D2 receptors are linked with decreased activity in that insula. Indicating indeed that having low levels of dopamine D2 receptors is likely to make you vulnerable to these compulsive behaviors because you are actually have decreased activity in areas of the brain that allow you to exert self-control. So if these areas of the brain are not properly functioning, then you cannot interfere with prepotent impulses to consume the reward. So this is based on our findings, the model that we have come to actually identify as relates to trying to understand how disruption of dopamine signaling, and in particular from the human studies that we have on D2 receptor signaling, could result in the compulsive phenotype that we see in addiction and that we have now been able to also identify in obesity. So in the non-addicted brain, uh, these systems in our brain are there for all to make decisions on depending on whether we should do one behavior or another. So in a non-addicted brain, we may be exposed to a reward, even though we know that reward may be pleasurable, we can at any given moment decide if we're going to consume the reward or not on the basis of our needs and alternative reinforcers and the appropriateness of consuming or not a reward. So if I am offered right now, for example, a glass of red wine, as much as I like red wine, uh, it would be utterly, I know that I would like to drink it, but I know that it's not appropriate and that I really don't want to be intoxicated while giving a talk. I mean, I actually, my brain will not function properly. So I made a decision, I balance how intense the reward is against my prefrontal cortex there in red, gigantic prefrontal cortex, that includes the anterior single leg cortex that actually makes a decision of this is appropriate or not. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is also involved in cognitive operations that can make judgments. The Brodmann area 44, which is in the part of the inferior frontal cortex that actually executes the, the motion to inhibit. it. So I have these strong signals. And, and while my memory systems that I'm not spoken about that lead to conditioning, which are also very important, and my medial orbital frontal cortex, which signals saliency value of alcohol, send this signal. 
Now that says yes, it's rewarding. The overwhelming response in my prefrontal -like cortex that said no, this is not uh, relevant, that inhibits the ventral tegmental area, nucleus accumbens, that normally uh, would, would drive the motivation to consume them, so this inhibitory action stops the response and I don't drink the glass. But if I'm addicted to alcohol and someone were to bring me that glass of red wine, immediately the conditioned responses would lead to activation of the VTA nucleus accumbens, that condition cue, the cue, the cue. I'm not consuming it, it's the cue. And I didn't present that because I didn't have time to present that. But when you have a cue, that will activate the nucleus accumbens. And that will in turn drive the motor system to want to consume it. The frontal cortical areas involved with self-control, the red one is not functioning properly. I show you that the B2 receptor signaling is basically weakened, so though that system is dysfunctional. On the other hand, the medial ventral areas of the prefrontal cortex that assign saliency value to the reward by projecting to the ventral segmental area and the nucleus accumbens to glutamatergic terminals that are sensitized through this ampine MDA signaling process, release dopamine, and then I cannot counteract that release because the prefrontal cortex, the dorsolateral, and the Rodman area 44, and the single edge arrows are not working properly, and there is an overdrive. There's no inhibition. So the signal goes through, the person consumes the drug, and even though the drug may produce this very weakened signaling, there's no way of counterbalancing it, and these triggers then this compulsion to take more and more and more. It goes into overdrive. There, is, there are no breaks. And this is what we postulate and others postulate drives the automatic compulsive behavior that result in addiction. And this, 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 this model actually also from the perspective of the clinical perspective gives you insight vis-a-vis -vis what interventions should be done to help an individual stop uh, overcoming these very strong urges to take the drug. And it actually guides us to actually interventions that can definitively strengthen. How do you strengthen self-control to help an individual be able to overcome those strong, strong urges? What interventions can we do to inhibit these prepotent responses that emerge when we get exposed to conditioned cues? What interventions we can give to provide individuals addicted to drugs to alternative rewards, such that there is competition and there is not just the reward system activated only by drugs and drug use. And it's obviously ultimately the combination of these different interventions that are, can help balance this uh, disruption of neuronal networks that are driving the person to do what appears to be very irrational behaviors to consume a drug whose consumption itself is sometimes not even perceived as pleasurable for the individuals, but that has become an automatic behavior that cannot be terminated even when the person no longer wants to take it. And with this, I want to thank my colleagues at Brookhaven National Laboratory with whom this work would have not been possible. And of course, I want to thank the National Institutes on Health for their, their general support of this research. And I want to thank you for your attention. Yes, I have five minutes time for questions. Then I have to run to another okay. meeting. Any, any questions? Hi, Norris. Chris Evans, how are you doing? Chris, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? Good. You're good. Uh, I, 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 my, my question is, um, are, are these changes in the D2 receptors, are they presynaptic or are they postsynaptic? Are you, do, do you know, can you differentiate between those? We cannot differentiate, actually, and that is an extremely important question because we have presumed all along that these are postsynaptic changes, but we really cannot say that, we don't know if they are from glutamatergic terminals that may be regulating glutamate release into the striatum, 
nor do we know if they are presynaptic in dopamine terminals that again may be regulating dopamine release. The only way of actually ultimately addressing this is to, to work with animal models where you selectively delete D2 receptors pre versus postsynaptically. And Emiliana Corelli has done some elegant work uh, with this type of transgenic knockout mice. We have not been able, and she has shown very significant behavioral disruption of how dopamine signaling is regulated in animals that don't have D2 receptor in the presynaptic dopamine terminal. We have not been able to take those mice, and it would be a wonderful study to do, to actually do it in optical imaging, which is actually the work that Congo Du and Jan Kim Pan have been doing at Stony Brook University with the development of optical tools that are now allow you to study in vivo animals. So you don't have to do this in slides and you can do the dynamic changes. So that would be the way to tackle it. And for as of now, we have not had access um, to such animal models. Yes, one, one general question. Do you, do you have uh, any additional data about the possible reversibility of these uh, cortical changes after long-term cessation of the of drug, drug uh, consumption? Well, in, in, in animals, in human studies, we have not been very good at uh, getting large numbers of patients that stay clean for long periods of time, and so long periods of time is basically where they need nine to 12 months. We have seen some evidence of recovery in some subjects, but not in others. So we don't have the statistical power to really say whether this is um, a consistent finding or, or what its significance is. Others, on the other hand, using uh, fMRI and ball responses have followed these individuals to try to see the extent to which actually the pathology on the prefrontal cortex predicts their relapse. And as you know, there have been several studies that have shown that indeed the, the ability of the single edge arrows or the inferior frontal cortex to respond to tasks that engage the no-go system, the inhibition system, in fact, do predict the extent to which a person will be able to stay in a rehabilitation program and not relapse. They are not perfect, but it's, it's a signal that as the stronger your prefrontal cortex, the better off you are. But in these particular studies, they have not gone to the further step to see is there improvement in signaling that. So I don't, I know, I mean, I do know that the researchers are looking into this, but I do not know, not right now in the top of my frontal cortex of, of any studies that have actually clearly documented the degree of recovery. So it's an area that is being investigated. We, we as our laboratory don't have data that, there, but others are investigating this. So hopefully one, one day we will have responses. What I can tell you from our attempts to, to follow these subjects is that there's tremendous variability. Some individuals are able to, to stop taking drugs and, um, and then we can see the recovery. But many of them will lose. They, they go back to relapse, and we cannot do how their brain looks. So we don't know if in those people their brain didn't recover, and that's why they relapse. Or so, so it's 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 a question that unfortunately I cannot answer to you. I predict, I predict that if you can strengthen it, because of course in animal models you can do that. And uh, Anto Bonchi did this very elegant study that he published in Nature, and others have followed that in his case, using optogenetic stimulation, if you can strengthen signaling from the prefrontal cortex, you can inhibit these prepotent responses. And in the laboratory, using MRI, um, uh, Rita Goldstein in, in our group had, had shown in the past, now she's at Mount Sinai, that when you give stimulant medications that enhance dopamine signaling, actually orally, you give stimulant medications orally as opposed to intravenous, you can strengthen prefrontal function. 
and then improve function on measures or cognitive measures of self-control. Which is why, why one can predict that if you are able to strengthen the prefrontal function through long-term detoxification or through medication interventions or through cognitive training, you may be able to actually improve it and uh, help individuals stop these prepotent responses to take them. Thank you very much, uh, Nora. Or, You're very or, welcome, uh, Rafael, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the meeting and that you all have a chance to enjoy beautiful Barcelona. Okay, okay thank you for your support. Thank Nora. you. Adios. Adios. Adios.